is saying, Juan, this is my son. This is Jesus Christ that came from heaven. John understood that. John understood who Jesus was because John had been brought to earth. I had been born on earth, was born to prepare the way of Jesus Christ. So he knew who Jesus was, and so when he had done the baptism, his thing was, why well, I don't need to baptize you. You need to baptize me because you're greater. Remember what John said last week? He said that John said, he is greater who that comes behind me because he was before me. He understood that Jesus had came down from heaven. But Jesus said that this needed to be done to fulfill all righteousness. So it's a time of revelation for the people to see that Jesus Christ really was the Son of God. And secondly, it was a time of identification, identifying with mankind. And, and for the people to understand that his purpose was to die on the cross. His purpose wasn't to do the healing or just the teaching. That was a part to get to the main purpose. And the purpose was to become the sacrifice for all mankind. He was the Lamb of God. And so he identified with mankind. And so think about it. Jesus he came down to earth to become a mediator. And so if you, if you think about a lawyer and, and you got a person that has to go before the judge and you have a lawyer right there and the lawyer comes or the mediator, the mediator comes and he, he stands between him and the judge and he pleads the case of the defendant. Jesus is our mediator between God and man. The point is, though, that it, you, it's hard to be a mediator of somebody if you don't understand their life. If you've had no experience about what they're living. And so the Bible says that in the book of Philipp, uh, Philippians that Jesus came down to put on mankind so that he would understand our life. It's one thing to create something but not to understand their life. But God created man, but, God, but Christ came down. And so that he would learn from us, learn what our life was so that he could be a better mediator for us. So the Bible says that once Jesus was baptized, he was taken into the wilderness. I'm from North Carolina. Wilderness is a different idea altogether. Wilderness for me is hundreds of miles of trees, of a forest. Tammy and I have been to Israel, and, and this is the wilderness of Israel. There are no trees. I remember we were going on a trip on Israel, and we're, we're riding in the van, and they're taking us around, around, and around again. And I, I told them, I said, okay, I've been here before. They go, really? This is our first trip. I said, yes, I've been here before. And they go, really? And I said, yes. I said, because I saw that same rock an hour ago. I mean, that's all you see as you travel out there, just rocks and desert and dryness. But the Bible says that the Spirit led Christ into the wilderness, and this was a time of temptation. It wasn't a time of temptation to help Jesus Christ grow, but so that he could identify himself once again with mankind. In the book of Hebrews, it tells us, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 through 18, it says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, talking about Jesus Christ, that through death he might destroy him that had power of the death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. The greatest fear that mankind has is death. The biggest thing that we worry about. You know, we, we talk about it. I, I tell people all the time, I'm not worrying about dying. I'm worrying about the way that I die. That bothers me more than anything else. But every man's going to die. But we're under bondage unto that. Our life, our life circles around that one truth right there. Verse 16, it says, For verily he took on him, not on him, the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Wherefore, in all things it behooved him to be made into the likeness unto his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. It's hard to be a representative of someone if you don't understand their life. 
You know, when, when we think about it, we, can, we want to be able to relate to them. There's another thing, what they call empathy. Empathy is that you share the same, uh, same struggle, same problem, so you can empathize. You can connect at a deeper, deeper uh, level. So Jesus came down here to understand what our life would be like. And so it said in verse 18, For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to secure them that are tempted. So when, you, when Jesus was being tempted in the wilderness, there's three temptations that Jesus was tempted with. Number one, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, and the lust of the eyes. When you see these three things, these are the three basic temptations that mankind has today. The Bible explains to us here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, to 16, it's the same temptation, it's the same struggles that every person has in life. It goes on to say, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, we're, we're talking about the world system, and the world system is something that takes us away from who God is. Has us just to focus on ourselves, has us to focus on anything else but who God is. Verse 16, it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So during this temptation in, in which they were having there, Jesus had been taken into the desert, and he had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now the scripture says the number 40 means trial. When you think of the number 40, you think of Noah, where it rained for 40 days and for 40 nights. You think of the children of Israel as they struggled in the wilderness for 40 years. So the number 40 talks about trials. And so we're going to look in the book of Matthew chapter 4, and we'll, we'll look through all the way through chapter 4, verses 1 through 10, but we're going to study each of the trials. There are three trials that's put in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. The first trial in which we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 4. Then was Jesus led up into the spirit, into the wilderness, to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward in hunger. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. So when we saw that the first temptation, the first temptation was the lust of the flesh. What is, what is the lust of the flesh? when you think about it. A loss of the flesh, a loss is a desire that controls us, that overrides everything that we have. So it's appropriate that Satan used what Jesus, in his human form, was desiring the most, and that was food. There's no sin in food unless you eat too much of it. There's scripture that talks about there are six sins and the seven sin that God hates. And in that seven sins, it talks about the sin of gluttony. We don't talk about that a lot because we like to eat. But the point is here, it, it's not a sin. What God was, when Christ was hungry, and Satan told him, he said, if thou be the son of God, command that these stones be made of bread. But Satan was using... Christ's weakness that what Jesus had in the time. It wasn't gold. Satan wasn't trying to tempt Jesus with gold, and he wasn't trying to tempt Jesus with uh, power, and he wasn't trying to tempt him, but with the basic necessities of food. Satan had told Jesus, if you are the Son of God, then turn these rocks into bread. And so the temptation 
was for Jesus to use the power within him for himself. Jesus could have changed the rocks into bread. Jesus had no problem uh, feeding the 5,000 with three loaves, of, uh, three loaves of bread and two fishes. Jesus didn't have a problem doing that. Jesus didn't have a problem in changing the water into wine. Jesus could take the basic elements and change it into, into what was needed. But what Satan was wanting Jesus to do was for Jesus to use his heavenly power in a selfish way. And that was the temptation there. And so Jesus, when Jesus spoke back to Satan, Jesus spoke out of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verse 3. He said, And he humbled thee, and suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which talking about uh, Israel when they were in the wilderness, which thou knewest not, neither did thy father know, that he might make thee know that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. The point was that Jesus understood what Satan was trying to get him to do. And the temptation was, it says here, that he might not make thee known, by, thou shalt live by bread alone. Physical substance isn't the most important thing in our life. I like to eat. I have no problem eating. I can eat almost anything. All right? But eating or physical substance isn't a problem or isn't a major thing in our life, even though we like to think so, but our spiritual life is. Following the will of the Lord for our life. You know, so many times we think about what's in front of our face right now. We think about the things that are controlling our mind and, can, and controlling our desires. But the thing is that should be controlling us is the Lord's will. To grow spiritually. Because in the end, that's all that's going to matter. When we look at it, the second temptation was the pride of life. In Matthew chapter 4, verse 5 through 7. And the devil taketh him up into the holy city and set up them on a pinnacle of the temple. And saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou shalt dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And so in this here, what you've got to understand is, what is Jesus talking about? What's the temptation? Well, the temptation was that they took him up on top of the temple, and it's, it's 200 feet from the top of the temple down to the ground. And what Satan is doing, he said, I want you to test God. How much are you important to God? So you step off, and you plummet to 200 feet down. We know that God's going to protect you. You're not going to be hurt. Now, the scripture says here in verse 7, he said, Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And the temptation was to get Jesus to tempt God and say, God, I'm going to put myself in a position in which you have to protect me, and if you love me, you're going to protect me. That's not what the verse was talking about. Satan had used that verse. Satan had used the verse that was written in Psalm chapter 91, verse 11 through 12. It was a verse of encouragement. How that we know that God would be with us and God would provide for us. In Psalm chapter 91, verse 11 through 12, it says, For he shall give thee angels charge over thee to keep thy in all thy ways. For thy shall bear thee up in thy hands, lest thou dash thy foot against this uh, stone. Satan knows just enough scripture because he was there when it was written. Satan can use the scripture and twist it around, use it the way he wants. Now, I've said this plenty of times. A preacher 
can pretty much say whatever he wants. He can pick out verses from the Bible and everybody will say, okay, he's speaking from God's word. And it may not be true. Just because a person picks out a verse to use does not mean that he's speaking from the word of God but that he's using his own imagination, his own thoughts. It's important for every Christian to know the Bible for themselves. I was teaching a Bible class on Friday. And, and as, as I was teaching a Bible class on Friday, I was asking the people there, you know, okay, as we're studying this, you know, they're, they're from other countries and they were coming in studying with me. And I said, okay, your preacher's back in your country. When they preach, do you agree with them? Yes. I said, do you check on what they're saying? They go, no, because they're the preacher. The position does not denote that we are to follow them. But it's whether or not they're teaching out of the Word of God. So for myself, when I'm preaching, you should be taking notes. You should be checking out what Pastor Ricky is saying. Is it true or not? Because you need to study for yourself what the Word of God says. Because the Word of God is so important for us to know. Satan used it. And so Satan was using this to try to get Christ to tempt God. And the Bible says, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. In Deuteronomy 6.16. It says, you shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. And so they were to come in and they were to worship God. And we don't put ourselves in a position in which we feel like God owes us. That's a, that's a big problem in Christianity today. Sometimes we feel like if we do something special for God, then God is indebted to us to answer our prayers. And so with Satan, Satan was telling Jesus, he goes, okay, I want you to put God in a position in which you're going to say, God, do you love me? I'm going to prove you love me. I'm going to step off. And you've got to prove you love me. Well, the scripture already says that God's going to protect Christ. But Jesus says, ye shall not tempt the Lord your God. And the Lord your God, he's talking about Jehovah. He said, we're not tempting God. I'm not going to be tempting God. So as Satan was coming up there, he was looking at ways of temptation. It's the same temptations that we have in life today. Well, we try to tempt God. If I do this, God, you are, you are obligated to answer my prayers. You are obligated to help me. I like the book of Job. When I first started reading the book of Job, let me go back. When I was growing up as a Christian, one of the books I tried to avoid the most in my life was the book of Job. The book of Job is talking about suffering. The book of Job is talking about problems in life. The book of Job is dry. It's not exciting. But then when I started teaching it, and, and I kept reading it over and over again, and, and we came down the Italian end, and I was starting to teach it in our Bible Institute. And then I was looking at it. Job is great. I love the book of Job. It's one of my favorite books now. Because the book of Job basically tells me that my life belongs to God. And God can do with my life as he wished because God created me for him. God is not indebted to us. We are indebted to God. And we are to use our life for the Lord. So here, Satan had been trying to tempt Jesus to do wrong. The third was the lust of the eyes. Now, when we're looking at the lust of the eyes, we've got to understand the, the goal that Jesus had coming into the world. The goal that Jesus had was to give all men an opportunity for salvation. So the goal that Jesus had was for all men to be saved. 
And the plan of God for this to happen was that Jesus was going to have to leave, leave heaven, come down on earth, put on mankind, live the life of a man for 30 years, be persecuted, have suffering, and then die on the cross. Now, in verse 8, the Bible says, And again the devil taketh them up into an exceedingly high mountain, and showeth them all the kingdoms of the world, and the glory of them. And he saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then said Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him alone shalt thou serve. What was the temptation? The temptation was for Jesus to take a shortcut. The temptation was to let Jesus see what he wanted. Jesus had a desire. Jesus' desire was, in his eyes, was to look on the things he desired, and it was for all men to be saved. And Satan says, okay, if you'll bow down and worship me, I'll give it all to you. You can go back to heaven. You don't have to suffer. You can take a shortcut. And we can have all this done right now if you'll just bow down to me. That is Satan's goal the whole time. Satan's goal is for us to worship him. Satan's goal is to be as God. That's the reason why God kicked out of heaven. It said that he had a desire to be as God. His whole life had been created around people to worship him. And so he had told Jesus that if Jesus would just worship him, he'll give him everything. Because that's all of, Jesus, uh, that's all of Satan's desire. In the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus quotes Deuteronomy one more time. Why? Because... The Old Testament. This was the New Testament that hadn't been written yet. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 13, it says, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and only shalt thou, uh, only shalt thou serve. We, or Jesus explained in him, God does not worship Satan, but Satan has to worship God. The authority comes from God. Now, the thing in what we've got to think about here as, as we consider it, what does the temptation show us? There is no sin in being tempted as long as the temptation is resisted. Every day in life, when we walk out the doors of the church, there is going to be temptations happening in our life. There's going to be temptations that Satan puts in front of us. And so the, the first temptation is if we're not saved, that the temptation is that Satan puts in front of us is uh, so that we won't listen about God, that we won't pay attention to God and we'll be distracted. And so that we don't accept Christ. And Satan wins. The second temptation is for mankind is that Satan gets us distracted once again, and so that we're not doing the will that God has called us to do. He puts things in our face each and every day. And there's going to be temptations not to obey God. There's going to be temptations to, to follow our own will, our, our lust. Temptations happening. Satan puts it in front of us. It's not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin to accept that temptation. We are to resist the temptation. There was a saying that said, you know, Satan is sort of like a bird's, and they fly through your hair all the time. And he said, that's not a problem, but you don't allow the birds to build a nest. You don't allow Satan just to stay there. That's our problem sometimes. The, the, the sin is not the temptation that goes by. 
And as you're looking at it, you, you're, you're being, you see things that you know is not proper for you. That's not a problem. The problem is when we go back and we come back again. And we go, well, you know, this kind of looks good. Maybe nobody will know. Maybe nobody will tell. So the Bible says that we are tempted when we give into our own desires, when we give into our own lust. Secondly, is that temptation is a lie. Temptation is making something that's wrong look good. Temptation is something that draws us away from God and gets us so that we're not focusing on God, but we're focusing on ourselves. And so as we look at that, we've got to understand, as we study God's word, when we look at the Bible, if we're not seeing God's word, we don't have much hope. If we look at the Bible as just another book, then really we don't have salvation. If we look at the, at the Bible and we say, well, this is a book that was, that's a good book to read and it has a lot of things that's suggested to me to do, you're not going to grow spiritually. You're not going to get connected to God. But the scripture says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. It's not enough to read the Bible, but we need to know the Bible. We need to spend time in the Word of God. Why could the Word of God defeat Satan? Remember Satan, and always remember this, Satan is a created being. He is a fallen angel. He is not equal with God. Okay, he's not. Therefore, he is created, he is created by God. Therefore, he cannot defeat God. So the word of God is like a command from the highest authority of the land. And he has to obey that word. He can do nothing else but to obey it. Because God had created him, and he will no day be more powerful than what God is. So that's the reason why the Lord gives us spiritual armor. That spiritual armor is to come in and we're to, we're to wear it. And we're to put it on daily. And the most powerful weapon that we have in our life is the word of God. It's what we can fight and defeat Satan with. The thing I want you to understand, Satan is not going to call you up and make an appointment to tempt you. Satan's going to wait for your lowest point. Just like fasting for 40 days. Struggles, we're, we're at the lowest point of our life, we're having struggles, and that's when Satan sends in the arrows of doubts about who God is and what God can do. It's at that time is where we need to prepare for the Lord. And the way we do that is by knowing his word. Not just carrying it, not just reading it, but applying it, memorizing it, and putting it into our heart that we remember. Because Satan's going to attack us when we're not ready. Therefore, we've got to be ready at all times. You can't let your guard down. But we've got to be prepared for Satan. Are we prepared? Do we spend time in God's word? Because the biggest weapon that we have in our arsenal against Satan is the Word of God. i like everybody to bow your head and close your eyes. Maybe there's someone here that would say, Brother Rick, I'm not a Christian. I've come to church, I've, I've heard speak about God, but I've never accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. I'm interested, I want to know more about God. Please pray for me that I would know enough that when time comes, I'll, I'll come and accept Christ. Is there anybody like that? Would you raise your hand? I won't go and talk to you, just pray for you. Say, I'm not saved, but I'm interested. I know I need to be saved. Is there anyone like that? Thank you. 
Maybe there's someone here today that said, Brother Rick, I haven't been following God like I should. Satan has been tempting me, and, and the problem is I've been coming back to that temptation, and I feel weak in my spiritual life. And there's some temptations, like I said, there's no sin in being tempted, but the sin is accepting that temptation. We're to resist it. But you say, Brother Rick, there's some problems in my life that come back daily. Please pray for me that I can be strong enough to resist that, that I can give it to God and allow God to fight for me. Is there anyone like that? Would you raise your hand? Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you. We all are tempted. Satan knows our weakness. So we need to spend time in the Word of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you care for us. You've given us your word that, Lord, that we have weapons against Satan. And, Father, Lord, just give us a, an understanding of what your word is. Lord, I pray for each and every person here. If there's anybody here that's not a Christian, Lord, I pray that um, they would be saved. They would accept you as Savior. Father, Lord, those who are struggling with temptations today, Lord, I pray that you would just... Uh, Guide them, direct them, help them see the temptation, help them understand what it is, and Lord, that they would give it to you, and as given it to you, Lord, that they would see that you'll have victory. Guide us and direct us, Lord. We ask this on the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Would you please stand? We're all going to stand. And I have, this is not the right time. Have a seat. Uh, Uh, this is Mark Butcher, and he is from Texas. I had an interview with him the other day, and uh, he just wants to give us a word of encouragement. Okay? And so uh, go ahead, let's try it now. Okay, we can pause that. Hi. I don't know who that guy is, but he talks a lot. All right. So uh, let's all uh, let's take the offering at this time. Jim Shed is gone. Okay.